Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the BBGI Global Infrastructure Annual Results Investor Presentation. Throughout this recorded presentation, attendees will be in listen-only mode. Questions are encouraged, and they can be submitted at any time using the Q&A tab just situated on the right-hand corner of your screen. Just simply type in your questions at any time and press send. The company may not be in a position to answer every question it receives during the meeting itself. However, the company can review all questions submitted today and publish responses when it's appropriate to do so. Before we begin, we'd like to submit the following poll, and I'm sure the company would be most grateful for your participation. I'd now like to hand over to Duncan Ball, CEO. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, and thank you. thanks to everyone who's uh, called in for the uh, investor meet presentation today. We appreciate your support and interest in BBGI. As mentioned, I'm Duncan Ball, and I'm here with Michael Denny, and we'll walk you through the slide deck. Um, so thank you very much. And in terms of beginning, I'll just kick off and, and read out our purpose, which is to deliver social infrastructure for healthier, safer, and more connected to societies while creating sustainable value for all our shareholders. Um, I know it's a bit cliche to read it out, but it does uh, very much deliver the message that we're trying to uh, achieve when we run the portfolio, which is to deliver benefits for all our stakeholders. So I'll begin on, uh, on the slide that um, talks about our investment approach. So our strategic pillars are low risk, internally managed, globally diversified, and a strong approach to ESG. So our strategic pillar of low risk is based on the fact that we have 100% of our portfolio is availability style investments. And what that means is these are contracted revenues coming from public sector counterparties, and we get paid when the infrastructure assets are available for use. So the outcome is that the, the cash flows are stable, predictable, with high quality inflation linkage. The second pillar is that we're internally managed. We're the only infrastructure company with an in-house management team, and our, and our interests are very much aligned with those of our investors. We focus on delivering shareholder value and we're not motivated by growth in AUM or growth in, growth in assets under management. Um, the third pillar is we're globally diversified. So we're uh, in a number of countries. They're all AA and AAA rated countries with a well-established rule of law where we're paid by um, credit worthy counterparties and um, that gives us a very stable operating environment. And the fourth pillar is we have a strong approach to ESG. ESG is integrated in all parts of our business model. Our portfolio delivers strong social impact. We're an Article 8 firm under the uh, EU Sustainable Finance Disclosure Regulations. And um, we've also tested our entire portfolio for climate resilience. And we're very happy of the fact that it's um, very future proof and, and resilient to climate change. Just to take you through our results that we released this morning, um, it's a, another set of strong results. The NAV per share reduced slightly by 1.4% to 147.8 pence per share. Um, based on our trading price, we're offering a 6.7% dividend yield, which we think is very attractive. Uh, we're happy to reconfirm our dividend targets for uh, 2023. Uh, 8.4 pence per share for 2024, representing a sector leading 6% increase year on year. And our target uh, dividend for uh, 2025 is 8.57 pence per share. The inflation linkage in our portfolio is very high quality and is contracted. And the inflation linkage is 0 0.5, meaning that if inflation is 100 basis points higher than our expectations, then um, the return will go up by 0.5%. Uh, the dividend is well covered at 1.4 times. The total NAV return since IPO is 8.6%. And our ongoing charge is the lowest in the sector at 93 basis points. The next slide takes you through our um, three business principles, which are uh, active asset management, prudent financial management, and a selective acquisition strategy. In terms of value-driven asset management, our 56 core infrastructure assets all performed well. None of our assets were uh, in lockup or distribution, and cash receipts were ahead of expectation. Uh, 
We continue to maintain a very high level of asset availability of 99.9%, which uh, contributes significantly to keeping our customers very happy. The second principle is our prudent financial management. So uh, at mid-year, we promised we would uh, repay the RCF, the revolving credit facility, by year end. And I'm pleased to announce this morning that we've done that. So we have no borrowings, uh, no drawings outstanding. Um, all our assets are financed on a non-recourse basis. So that means that they're, they're not tied to one another, that they all are uh, independently financed. And 55 of 56 have no refinancing risk. One asset has a tranche of um, uh, debt that is subject to a refinancing every five years, but the base rate is, um, is, is hedged for the full duration. Um, and then finally on this slide, um, touch on our selective acquisition strategy. We apply a very disciplined approach to our capital allocation and screening any potential acquisitions. We looked at a number of varieties during the year but we chose not to buy anything. We directed our surplus cash flow towards the repayment of our drawings on our revolving credit facility. Um, and we'll consider growth in the future, but we'll be very uh, selective in doing so and be very much balanced on uh, portfolio construction. We go to the next slide. This just highlights the benefits of our internal management structure. Uh, we think it's a key differentiator. What I mean by internal management is that there is myself and Michael presents later and, and the rest of our team, we all work for the company. We don't work for an external fund manager that's providing services to the company. Um, so that means um, that our interests are very much aligned with those of shareholders. We have a very experienced uh, team and the team's alignments are very much with those of the shareholders. Our ongoing charge is the lowest in the sector at 93 basis points. And um, it also means that we, we don't charge for acquisitions or dispositions. We're not motivated in growth in AUM. Um, the next slide just talks about uh, our approach to capital allocation. This is a very topical question. Um, in the recent periods, we've benefited from higher inflation and we've earned more uh, interest on the uh, cash reserves we have at the various portfolio companies. So that has benefited us. What we've done with that is we've paid it back to shareholders through increased dividends. So we paid out these earnings to shareholders by increasing the dividend 6% in 2023, again, 6% in 2024, and then we're forecasting a further increase in 2025. We used excess cash flow during the year to re repay our revolving credit facility, and we now have no debt. Um, as we move forward, we'll be very disciplined uh, about how we approach new opportunities, and uh, it makes sense to uh, measure any alternative use of capital um, uh, against alternatives. So we'll look at accretive investments, but we'll also consider share buybacks and you know our focus is to do what is in the best interest of the company, but also take into consideration the interests of the shareholders and balance that uh, that equation. The next slide, um, this slide dem demonstrates our ability to grow our portfolio organically. In 2022, we bought two assets for over 60 million pounds. We bought the A7 motorway, an interest in the A7 motorway in Germany. And we also bought an interest in the John Hart generating station, um, a power electric facility in British Columbia, Canada. Um, both have performed very well. And we drew on our revolving credit facility to pay, these, pay for these assets. And uh, by the end of 2023, we've paid off our RCF. So we've effectively bought these assets out of free cash flow. So it's demonstrated our ability to grow organically. The next slide um, highlights the strong dividend track record that we've been able to achieve. Uh, we're very proud that we've been recognized by the Association of Investment Companies as a next generation dividend hero. Uh, this is because we've been able to increase our dividends for at least 10 years. Um, we 
started increasing the dividends uh, back in, in 2013, and we've achieved a 3.4% increase since IPO. More recently, 6% last year, 6% forecasted for uh, 2024, and then a further 2% in 2025. Um, the current dividend yield based on the share price um, earlier in the week was 6.7%, which we think is very attractive, especially for a, a well-covered dividend. And um, we're also proud of the fact that our dividend growth has outpaced UK CPI over the, the corresponding period. If we go to the next slide, not only have we done grown the dividend, but we've also grown the underlying NAV. So you're, as an investor in BBGI, you're not only getting dividend growth, but you're getting NAV growth. So uh, over the last 12 years, uh, the accumulated NAV and dividend per share adds up to uh, 223p per share. Uh, so that's uh, had you invested at IPO at 100p. And we've always shown a growth in, um, in NAV and dividend growth on a year-on-year -year basis. The total NAV return since IPO is 8.6 on an annualized basis or 170% over that period. And uh, the TSR, the total shareholder return, which is based more on market prices, um, is a 7.6% annual, annual growth or 141% over the corresponding period. If we go to the next slide, this slide demonstrates the four key strengths of our portfolio. So 100% uh, of our investments are in low risk core infrastructure assets. 100% of our assets are operational with no construction exposure. We had one asset um, in Canada, the Highway 104, which became operational in uh, mid-year last year. So now 100% of our portfolio is operational. We've got a well-diversified portfolio. Uh, we're in attractive, credit-worthy countries with AA and AAA ratings. You know, we're in Australia, Canada, the US, UK, Germany, Netherlands, and Norway. So all very strong countries where we're paid by credit-worthy governments. And we have an attractive sector mix. Um, and we have, we're delivering a social impact portfolio with um, uh, diversified sector exposure. So we have schools, hospitals, roadways, educational facilities, affordable housing, clean energy, uh, an attractive mix. Um, this provides a little more granularity on our, on our portfolio. Um, we have a well-diversified portfolio in terms of the different assets and the top 10 constitutes for 48%. So no one asset is is uh, there's there's no concentrated exposure in any one single asset. Likewise, we have a diversified supply chain of partners, so we have broad exposure with a, a whole bunch of uh, strong, credit-worthy counterparties that are providing services to us on a day-to-day -day basis at the assets. And we have a young portfolio with a long remaining investment life, and the average portfolio life is 19.3 years. This slide just shows some of the, gives a bit of a collage of some of the photos that we we have in our assets, but just to tell you a little bit about the portfolio. So we have 19 roads and bridges. We have a fully electric public transit line. We have 41 essential healthcare facilities, four police stations, 26 fire stations, four modern correctional facilities, 33 schools and colleges, three affordable housing uh, facilities, two community centers, a hydroelectric generating station and two uh, public administration buildings. And then this portfolio delivers a lot of benefit to the society it serves. You know, our hospitals service about 4 million patients a year with 2,400 beds. Our fire stations protect 800,000 people against fire related injuries. Our roads include 2,800 single lane kilometers of, of roadway, um, which allows reduced travel times for about 290 million vehicles a year. And our hydroelectric facility provides clean power to over 80,000 homes. So it's, you know, we're very proud of what we have in our portfolio. The next slide just showcases our team a little bit. Uh, so we have um, uh, uh, about 30 people in our team. 
uh, with extensive backgrounds in engineering, construction, asset management, finance, accounting, ESG, risk and compliance, and valuation, and, and, and IT. Um, our team is spread out. We're, we have people in eight different countries, so they're focused on value preservation and value enhancement, but they're also very close to our clients because they're located in regions where our assets are, and um, they're very focused on delivering the, the assets to a high standard, and that's evidenced by the high availability rate, so 99.9% .9 availability during the reporting period. And we do an annual canvas of our clients, and we have a net promoter score of 56, which is uh, a very strong net promoter score. And what it means is we have happy clients. So it goes a long way towards having um, a robust portfolio. When your clients are happy, your assets are available, and uh, none of them are in lockup or um, have any uh, impairments on distributions. It makes life a lot easier and, and results in positive client relationships. So, so we're very proud of that. Uh, the next slide, this is just trying to show you some of the things that go on on a day-to-day -day basis in our portfolio. Um, with the focus on AI, we wanted to show some of the activity that we're doing in, in where we're using AI in our portfolio. So we began using AI on our road projects uh, last year. Um, what we've done is we've mounted external cameras on our asset managers' cars, and every time they drive up and down our roadways, uh, they're capturing images. They have a small Samsung Galaxy tablet in the, on the dash of their car. It collects the data. The data is uploaded to the cloud. Um, the, the images of the road surfaces are then analyzed using machine learning. It creates real-time auditing of our roadway surfaces. It's G GPS reference data, and it really helps us in the predictive maintenance. It's safer for our, um, our staff because they're not out standing on the roadway looking at potential potholes. It allows us to tr track the assets as they, um, you know, in real time. It's much more cost effective because they just drive up and down the roadway and they don't have to, we don't have to engage third party experts to do this work that's very time consuming otherwise. It results in happy clients, happy users, because we're able to better manage the life cycle and um, uh, you know keep keep the the road surfaces in top top notch shape. And with that, I'll pause and turn it over to Michael Denny, our CFO, who will walk you through uh, the slides on valuation. Thanks, Duncan. So just as a reminder, um, we value the portfolio twice per year in June and December. And the management board is supported by the val internal valuation team, which develops the valuation using a discounted cash flow methodology. The resulting valuation is then reviewed by both our external valuer and also audited by the company's external auditor, PwC. And this valuation process methodology is unchanged since we IPO'd back in 2011. So on, on this slide, it, it, we, we go a little bit deeper into the factors which contributed to the modest 1.2% NAV decrease over the year. And if we start with the portfolio return, which contributed a positive 93.7 million, which resulting from the unwinding of the discount rates and portfolio performance. 18.5 million of the 93.7 million is attributable to the value enhancements delivered through our active asset management. These value accretive activities included effective life cycle cost management, portfolio company savings, change order revenue, tax and treasury management, and optimized cash reserving. Next, if we look at the change in market discount rates, which resulted in a further decrease of 41 point 41 million with a weighted average discount rate moving from 6.9% to 7.3%. We continue, we continue to apply a market-based approach when setting the discount rates. And while transaction data was more muted in 2023, there were a sufficient number of relevant data points observed which support the rates we have used. We have obtained at least one relevant transactional data point for each currency in which we invest except for the Norwegian kroner. Each data point represents a transaction closed in December 2022 or later. 
And two of the data points are from auction processes where BBGI participated in in North America. In the case of Norway, where no transactional data was available, a risk premium of 3.7% has been applied over the risk-free rate. Changes in macroeconomic assumptions resulted in an increase of 11.4 million, or 1.1% on the NAV. The main drivers were short-term and long-term deposit rates, um, assumptions, accounting uh, increases, accounting for a 25.7 million increase, and forecast inflation contributing a further 4.2 million. Against this, the company took a final provision of 16.3 million, reflecting the negative impact of the Canadian Excessive Interest and Financing Expenses Limitation Rules, or IFL, adding to the 9.8 million position taken in the financial year 2022. Foreign exchange provided a further headwind, resulting in a decrease of 23.3 million, with the sterling appreciating against all currencies. However, this downside was partly mitigated by our FX hedging leading to an overall net negative movement of 9.5 million on the NAV. The, the next slide illustrates the weighted average discount rate used since IPO and the allocation between the risk-free rate and the risk premium. So our methodology for determining discount rates is based primarily on market observed transactions. For, 20, for the 2023 valuation, we have used a weighted average discount rate of 7.3%, which is up 40 basis points on the rate we use for the December 22 valuation of 6.9%. Again, in 2023, we have complemented our market-based approach with a capital asset pricing model approach, where government risk-free rates plus a risk premium are used to construct the discount rates. The CAPM approach is used primarily as a reasonability check to our market-based approach, particularly in periods where there is reduced or limited market data. As can be seen from the chart on the slide, the weighted average risk-free rate for the year was slightly reduced at 3.6% compared to 3.8% at December 2022. Based on this risk-free rate and our weighted average discount rate, the resulting risk premium is 3.7%, which the management board views to be appropriate for a portfolio of low risk availability style investments. While the risk premium has increased year on year, we believe it is appropriate given the observed market data and the elevated macroeconomic volatility observed during the reporting period. It is also well within the observed historical range. The, the next slide presents the key macroeconomic assumptions used in the valuation for 2023. If we start with inflation, with the exception of the UK, where there's been a slight increase in long-term rates, all other long-term rates um, uh, rate assumptions have remained unchanged compared to December 2022. For the 2023 valuation process, we have introduced a short-term 2025 inflation rate assumption where official forecasts are available recognizing that in some jurisdictions inflation is expected to be sticky and continue to be at heightened rates into 2025. Deposit rates, uh, short-term deposit rates have risen broadly in line with the increase in underlying benchmark rates and reflect those rates that were being achieved on our deposits at the end of 2023. We expect the deposit rates to remain at elevated levels in most jurisdictions during 2024. We have also updated our long-term deposit rate assumptions to reflect the current rate environment, bringing them in line with long-term averages. The effect of revised deposit rate assumptions resulted in a 25.7 million or a 2.4% increase in the NAV. And corporate tax rates have remained unchanged in the 23 valuation process. The next slide focuses on BBGI's high-quality inflation linkage. So despite inflation now appearing to be under control, it still remains an important topic and one which we're very often asked about. This particular slide highlights how BBGI benefits from high-quality inflation linkage. The bar chart on the left-hand side of the slide shows the uplift in the NAV in both percent and pence per share, or inflation to be two percentage points higher for one 
or three years. For example, if inflation is two percentage points higher for three years than our forecast assumptions, then all else being equal, the NAV will increase by 2.9% or by 4.3 pence per share. We have a high quality inflation linkage of 0.5%, notable for its contracted nature. This high quality label is justified by our contractual arrangements, whereby public sector clients are committed to paying an availability fee, including an explicit pass-through, providing direct contracted inflation protection. Then the next slide presents some of the key variables considered in the valuation process and how sensitive the NAV is to changes in them. As you can see, the NAV the impacts vary, but by far the most sensitive of these variables is the discount rate, where a 100 basis point increase would result in a NAV decrease of 7.3%. However, it is unlikely that changes in discount rates will happen in isolation. Therefore, when we talk about changes in rates, it is important to consider all rates, inflation rates, deposit rates, and inflation rates, as they are all interlinked. If we take a scenario where discount rates move by 1%, then it might be reasonable to assume that deposit rates and inflation rates might move by a similar amount. So in other words, a 1% increase in each of these rates would result in a 1.5% decrease in NAV. This would represent approximately one-fifth of the impact of assuming that only the discount rates were changed or varied in isolation. And with that, I will now hand back to Duncan. Thanks, Michael. Um, I'll just take a moment and talk about our role as a responsible investor in social infrastructure. So we publish a standalone ESG report and invite anyone who's interested to go to our website. We have the report for last year uh, on there. We will publish the uh, new report for this year in, in June. Um, and it provides details on how we progress during the year. In our annual report that we released today, we also outline some of the progress we've made in the, in, in the um, business over the course of the year. The key highlight is that uh, during this year, we completed a comprehensive data collection exercise to assess the greenhouse gas emissions uh, within our portfolio. So this is not just BBGI corporate, but this is at the 56 portfolio companies. So we now have all that data. So we've collected scope one, scope two, and scope three emissions, and we're using that data um, to develop net zero plans. You may ask yourself, why are we doing this? Well, one, it's it, it's uh, it helps with the reporting and helps with the, our investors, but it also helps with our clients in that um, if if you think of who our clients are, it's typically government agencies uh, that have all committed to net zero uh, targets. And so we believe that if we track the emissions in the portfolio and come up with ideas about how uh, they can reduce the emissions coming out of the, the various assets, we may have an opportunity to work with our clients to support them, but also to earn change order revenues or uh, affect change that can can do do good, uh, so we can do well by by doing good. Um, we also produced our uh, principal adverse impact statement, which is a requirement under the Sustainable uh, Finance Directive, and we uh, that disclosure includes twelve environmental and eight social metrics. So that's all available on our website as well. And as a final reminder, we did a comprehensive study on our entire portfolio. Uh, two years ago, where we looked at eight different climate perils under three different climate warming scenarios and under three different horizons. Um, the, the reason we did this was not only to uh, help help improve the resilience of our assets, but it was part of a risk mitigation exercise where we're, we're very confident that our portfolio is, is robust and climate resilient. And we're not going to wake up in five or 10 years time and find we have stranded assets because we hadn't considered climate change and they're no, no longer saleable. So we're very comfortable with the outcome of that exercise and, and take comfort in the fact that we have a very good climate resilient portfolio. If we go to the next slide, um, it just talks about the outlook and what we're seeing. And so um, capital allocation is key as uh, whenever we talk about outlook. Uh, last year, we directed surplus cash 
towards the repayment of our revolving credit facility. Now with a clean balance sheet, no debt, we're well positioned to consider new opportunities. We're looking at a lot of opportunities, and, but we're being very selective in what we pursue. Um, the common theme, irrespective of the geographies we're in, is that governments are stretched. Their balance sheets are uh, uh, challenged after COVID where there was a lot of fiscal spending. And uh, we very much believe that private capital is required to address the infrastructure gap. There's four key themes there. We call it the four Ds. So it's decarbonization, so energy transmission. It's the advent of digital uh, infrastructure, so data centers, fiber, towers, et cetera. Demographics that are, uh, you know, as people age, there's more requirement for healthcare facilities, hospitals, et cetera. And deteriorating, the, the 4D is deteriorating infrastructure. A lot of the infrastructure that we rely on today is no longer fit for purpose or it's uh, it's past its best before date and needs upgrading or, or re-enhancement. So we very much believe that they're going to be can continue to be opportunities for us and others to invest in a critical infrastructure and do so on attractive terms. But, you know, as, as always, um, we will adapt to remain relevant, but our DNA remains the same, which is we're very disciplined and structured in how we approach acquisitions. Um, and if we were to make any changes to our acquisition strategy, it would be very slow and progressive and in line with our investment policy um, our focus remains on low risk investment assets with uh, strong inflation correlation. And um, so we're optimistic about the future. We're well positioned to execute in the future because we have a clean balance sheet and we have strong industry relations that allow us good access to deal flow. And as a reminder, we have a, a pipeline agreement with Atkins Realis, used to be known as SNC, but um, uh, they rebranded so that's that's why you probably see different uh, disclosure in the in the um, annual report where we reference it but that to, to, to just note on that topic it's an option not an obligation so as they present assets to us uh, in the future we'll be selective and uh, we we're under no obligation to buy them and we have no other outstanding forward commitments or purchase obligations so um, we're we're in a very strong position to consider the future so I'll just conclude by saying we're very proud with the performance that's come out of our low risk resilient portfolio. We're delivering critical infrastructure. So healthcare, schools, um, fire stations, police stations, affordable housing, transportation, all with a strong social purpose. It's all availability based. Um, and uh, we're paid by strong government parties, counterparties. It's climate resilient, has strong inflation linkage it has low correlation to other asset classes and um, you know we're going to be uh, disciplined in terms of how we construct and grow the portfolio in the future um, and with that i'll stop and thank you for your interest and we'll we'll try to address some of the questions that have been raised that's great duncan michael thank you very much indeed for your presentation and for updating investors this afternoon ladies and gentlemen please do continue to submit your questions using the q a tab just situated on the right hand corner of the screen which is why duncan and michael take a couple of moments just to review your questions submitted already i'd like to remind you that recording this presentation along with a copy of the slides and the published q a will be accessed via your investor me company dashboard uh duncan michael you've received a number of questions throughout your presentation so firstly thank you to everybody for your engagement this afternoon uh, if i I may i'll hand back to james if i could ask you please just to read out the questions where it's appropriate to do so and i'll pick up from you at the end thanks very much mark um so the first question handbacks will be less than one percent for the next five years you have also stated that a progressive dividend possible for the next 15 years without any new assets being acquired approximately how much would you would need to be reinvested in relation to the dividend cover for this to be pushed out indefinitely so far this year, you had 1.4 times dividend cover. Is this level expected to be continued? And would the excess be sufficient in the long term to replace handbags? The crux of the question is, if the share price continued to be below NAV, would you have the income long term to fund progressive dividends and to fully replace handbags without the need for issuing new equity? OK, maybe I'll take that. Um, There's a lot of, lot of concepts in that question, but I'll try to address them. Um, first off, handback. Um, so those who may not be familiar, the concept of handback 
I guess the best way to describe it is it's like when you rent an apartment, you may have an obligation at the end of the lease to do a walkthrough with your landlord. And if you punched a hole in the drywall, you, you they keep your security deposit. But if the building's in good shape or the, the apartment unit's in good shape, you get your security deposit back. The same concept applies in these public-private partnerships where um, you have to meet certain standards at the end of the concession. Um, the way we mitigate against that is we have happy clients, we maintain the buildings to a high standard, and we're continually addressing deferred maintenance, so it, it, or addressing issues so that we don't have deferred maintenance issues. So um, in terms of our portfolio, we have less than 1% of the portfolio is subject to hand back in the next five years. If you look forward uh, to 10 years, it's 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 11%. So it's uh, not a big number in the next decade. Um, so we're not too worried about that. What we've said is we've said we can continue to provide a progressive dividend for the next 15 years without any new uh, investments. When we say progressive dividend, what we mean is that we increase the dividend by 2% each year. So that's what we, you know, we've had to make an assumption about what a progressive dividend is. Uh, certainly our plan is not to sit on our hands for the next 15 years or, or, you know, we would like to continue to invest in the portfolio and, and do so on a, on a uh, measured basis. I think the example I gave in the presentation of the A7 and the uh, John Hart generating station gives you an example where we bought two assets and have effectively paid for them out of uh, free cash flow. I haven't done the, the math in terms of the dividend cover, but if you're, uh, you know, so it, 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 and it, and it's a difficult number to forecast because our cash flows are not uh, consistent every year. They, they undulate uh, depending on, um, you know, you can, you can imagine with a portfolio of 56 assets, uh, there is some, I would say seasonality, but but different different projects distribute at different levels at different points in their life cycle. So um, our cash flows are are um, uh, predictable, but they're not uh, linear. So I think the the takeaway should be that we're going to continue to look to deploy capital in attractive manners, but we're very comfortable that if we did nothing today that we could continue to provide a progressive dividend for the next 15 years at a 2% annual growth. Hopefully that's answered the question. Thanks, Duncan. Um, are you concerned about the discount to NAV? Do you have to grin and bear it? Or have you considered share buybacks such as Heckel have done? Um, it's a good question. You know, our, our approach to capital allocation has been um, to first, we benefited from higher inflation and deposits, and we've shared that with our investors by increasing our dividend. So that's the first approach. The second approach was we said when we had excess capital, um, we would use it to pay down our RCF, which we've done. Now we're in the envious position that we will, going forward, we will have surplus cash flow. And uh, I think what we will say is that we'll, we'll look at uh, things in the round and it's measuring or balancing new opportunities against share buybacks. Um, and it's, it's not just about math, it's about um, the long-term interests of the, of the company. So it's, but you know, I'll, I'll preface that by saying, Michael and I are shareholders, our staff are, are, are shareholders in the company. So we're very much aligned with the interests of investors, but we wanna, also uh, have a, a viable company that um so we'll look at the uh we'll look at what the shares are, are trading at and we're not adverse to uh, a share buyback but we're not also we're not committing to a share buyback today because uh, we don't know what the future holds so ho hopefully that addresses the question thank you can you elaborate on how you evaluate potential new investments and what criteria are used to determine what, determine whether an investment is accretive to shareholders? Uh, yeah, I'm happy to take that one as well. We look at a variety of factors. So it's um, it's what does it do for the portfolio construction? We say that there's no perfect asset. Um, there's no asset that gives you all the attributes you want. 
Uh, we like inflation linkage. We like stable, predictable, uh, increasing dividends. We like assets that have growing NAV profiles. But the reality is, it's it's rare that you get an asset that has everything um, and is well, you know, is available at a reasonable price. So uh, it's everything. It's like everything in life. It's a series of trade offs where you're looking at what does this do for portfolio construction. What does it do to immediate yield? What does it do to long-term yield? What does it do to NAV accretion? What does it do to um, uh, portfolio mix, balancing in our, our currency exposures, our country exposures, et cetera? So there's no simple answer. So when we say um, an asset has to be attractive, it has to be uh, helpful for const portfolio construction, but the lens also is... Uh, if we're trading at a discount, would we be better off using that cash to buy back shares or do something else? So um, it's not a it's not just a simple either or. It's a quite a complex decision process. How does BB, BBGI plan to address the discrepancy between private market valuations of infrastructure assets and public market values to enhance shareholder value? I think that's a good question. I think that's the uh, question that everyone's asking. Uh, the, the, the alternative investment sector as a whole has, has suffered and is trading at a discount to NAVs. Um, and I think there's a number of reasons for that. But I think we can do what we can, which is in our control, which is continue to manage the assets well, continue to uh, have, have a conservative balance sheet, not get overextended. And um, but in, in terms of managing the, the discount, um, you know, what we're trying to do is trying to um, increase awareness of the opportunity. I think when you see a, a stock like BBGI, where we've got a, a very strong history of paying progressive dividends, we've got a well covered dividend. We trading at a 6.7 dividend yield. We've got inflation linkage. Uh, you know, I think the, the best thing we can do is make potential investors aware of that and try to bridge the gap. Um, we will look at, uh, you know, other things such as share buybacks, but um, again, um, it's probably not going to move the needle in the, in the short term. So I think the sector has to re-rate a little bit, but I think it's a, it's a tremendous buying opportunity for those that have perhaps a, 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 a more uh, a long-term view on how the sector can recover. Thanks, Duncan. Um, there are some questions around your exposure to bridges, certainly given the tragic events in Baltimore. Um, um, so your exposure to bridges and in the unlikely event that one of your bridges or other facilities are disrupted for some reason, what's the impact on the trust capital value and income and to what extent does insurance cover for this, if any? Yeah, let, let me begin by saying that what, what happened in Baltimore was tragic. Um, and I understand it raises concerns about safety of bridge structures and, and how they interface with maritime travel. Um, so just to compare and contrast, um, the Francis Scott Key Bridge in, in, in Baltimore, um, it was built in 1977. And, um, you know, it's quite a bit different than our bridges. Uh, we, we have four significant cable stay bridges in our portfolio. Uh, we have Goldeners Bridge, Champlain Bridge, East End Crossing and Mersey Gateway Bridge. These were all built later. Um, Goldeners was built in 2009. Champlain 2019, East End Crossing 2016, and Mersey Gateway 2017. So these have all been built to much, much higher uh, standards that have been brought about. Um, the standards changed dramatically in 1980. And um, the other big differentiator is we don't have the same type of maritime traffic um, traveling under our bridges. Golden years, there's no deep sea vessels allowed. It's only small boats and, and barges. Um, East End Crossing, it's the same thing. It's 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 got barge resistant uh, impacts, but it's it's not it's not the same type of travel. Mersey Gateway in the UK, which may be familiar with some of our listeners, it only accom accommodates local yachts and commercial boats, and there's a separate shipping channel which is designed against protection 
uh, it has protection mechanisms designed against such impacts. And then Champlain Bridge, which is in Montreal, Canada, um, there is shipping under that, that's, but there, it's a dedicated canal. It's the St. Lawrence Seaway and uh, our bridge is well protected from that and away from that. So we, we don't think what happened in um, Baltimore is going to happen to our portfolio. We have insurance on all these assets. Um, a good question would be what, what you know, does, does what happened in Baltimore drive up insurance rates? Uh, most of our project agreements have a provision that uh, if sure insurance is unavailable in the market, then the governments come step in and self insure. So um, we're not worried about it. And, uh, you know, we have rigorous testing on our bridges and, and annual inspections, and we have protection mechanisms. So I think it's a quite a different situation. What I would take away from the um, situation in Baltimore is it really highlights the fact that there's been underinvestment in infrastructure and a lot of the infrastructure we rely on is, is we, we may use it, but it's not necessarily fit for purpose. And I think that will create an opportunity for further investment in the future. In the current economic environment, what are the primary challenges you face in acquiring new assets and how do you overcome these to, con to continue delivering value to shareholders? I think, you know, we've different markets, we present different challenges. Um, a couple of years ago, it, we were in a different market and the challenge was uh, not overpaying for assets. It was a frothy in, environment and we remain very disciplined right now we're in a market where we're seeing more opportunities but we're again we're going to be disciplined and we're going to try to pick out the best opportunities so i think it's all about the dna and uh, of our organization which is we are long-term investors in critical infrastructure we uh, are going to be selective in what we pursue i think there will be opportunities out there but we're going to Value those evaluate those opportunities against other uses of capital, and we're going to be disciplined. The, the, at, at the core of all this is our internal management structure, where we are motivated by the exact same things that shareholders are motivated, which is dividend growth and NAV preservation and growth. Um, we're not an external manager that is motivated by growth in AUM. So it, it creates a different set of incentives. Uh, our incentives are very much aligned with investors. And so we're going to bring that discipline uh, to bear. And I think you'll see us continue to act as we have historically over the last 12 and a half years and, and, and be disciplined in what we what we uh, pursue. But I think, uh, you know, we I'm optimistic that we'll be able to continue to uh, deploy capital and attractive opportunities. Are any of your assets exposed to clawback risk, um, where the grantor can buy the asset from you at a pre-agreed price? Um, we typically, um, these projects have um, a termination for convenience clause, but, um, you know, and that's, that's not uncommon when you're dealing with governments, but uh, you, you, when you terminate for convenience, it's like when you break your mortgage, you have to pay back, uh, you, you, you can't do so without penalty. Um, if if governments were to terminate for convenience, they would typically have to pay out the debt first, and then they would have to pay out uh, the equity. And as mentioned earlier, we find that governments around the world have stressed balance sheets, so we're not seeing this as a as a as, as a major concern. And if it were to happen, we would be protected. How do you exclude biodiversity sensitive areas from your portfolio? Roads, bridges, et cetera, are bound to be near areas that others are likely to define potentially in the future as biodiversity sensitive. So biodiversity is a, a big topic for us and much the way we've done uh, climate reviews uh, on our portfolio, we're, lo we're looking at biodiversity reviews as well. Um, probably the assets that are most impactful on biodiversity are our roads because you can imagine a road passes along a large large area as mentioned we've published our what's called our uh pai uh statement and pai is um principal adverse impact statements 
and that has a lot of disclosure about biodiversity. And um, so I invite you, whoever's asked this question, we can send you uh, details on it. And, and, and we talk about uh, 12 environmental metrics that we use for considering biodiversity. But we're, we're you know, we, we look at that, but we also are very proud of some of the biodiversity uh, initiatives we've taken in our portfolio. On our roadway in um, East End Crossing, we've let the grasses on the side of the road grow longer to uh, create habitat for monarch butterfly. We produce BBGI honey. The, it's, the, the BB is a play on the fact that we have bees on some of our road. We, we, we work with local hobbyists and enthusiasts, and we put um, uh, beehives on some of our roads to uh, create habitat for bees. We have, um, if you look at our annual re or our, our results presentation, I think if you turn to slide um, 13, maybe while we're just talking, I'll go to slide 13. You can see that's the A7 motorway in Germany. And um, it looks kind of funny to have an overpass with uh, grass and, and, and greenery on it. That's actually an animal crossing. Uh, so we've considered biodiversity in that. And that allows animals for, to uh, pass over the motorway without being struck by vehicles uh, through a dedicated corridor. So we, we have a lot of things like that. We have uh, fish ladders on uh, Highway 104. We put uh, money into um, uh, aquatic marine grasses on Kicking Horse Canyon to uh, encourage salmon spawning. We've got uh, dedicated areas on Champlain Bridge for peregrine, peregrine falcon nesting. So we've done a lot of things in our portfolio uh, to support biodiversity, but there, there's a lot more disclosure on that in their ESG report. And lastly, Sivar, what's the biggest risk, impact and likelihood of it facing the world in which BBGI operates? Um, I think the... Um, um, the, probably the best way to describe that is we have quite an extensive risk register and um, it's a it, it's a very detailed process and it's something we look at extensively with our supervisory board and we review it on a regular basis we track a whole host of risks and um, there's no one risk that is causing us great concern but we do track a number of risks and, um, um, you know, rather than try to highlight one risk, I would encourage you to read the section of our annual report where we talk at length about the risk factors within our portfolio. But I think, you know, there was a question about the bridge earlier on, and um, hopefully my response there um, helps you understand that we're doing a lot of things proactively to consider risks. So. We, we have extensive reviews when we buy assets to make sure we're not buying something that has a, um, a large risk that we're not aware of. We review the portfolio on a regular basis. We're, um, we're trying to remain topical on emerging topics like biodiversity and try to be progressive there so that doesn't become a risk. So um, risk we have a dedicated risk and compliance officer and uh, that person make sure we're thinking about what lies around the corner so that's great james and uh, duncan michael thank you very much indeed in fact you've answered all the questions that have been submitted from investors today so thank you once again to everybody for your engagement um duncan i know that investor feedback will be particularly important to you and to michael and to the team and i'll shortly redirect those on the call to give you their feedback uh, but before doing so if i may duncan just come back to you for a couple of closing comments and then i'll send investors to give you their thoughts and expectations Thank you. So th thank you for everyone who dialed in today. I um, appreciate everyone making the time before a, a, a bank holiday. And uh, we, we thank you for those of who are shareholders for your support. Uh, for those who aren't shareholders, we hope you become shareholders. Uh, we think it's a, a compelling story and we're very proud of what we're doing in the portfolio. We're happy to serve the public the way we do. And we're happy to have happy clients and engaged staff. And we enjoy what we do and what we're um, um, uh, very optimistic about the future and our ability to continue to produce stable, predictable returns for our investors. 
That's great. Duncan, Michael, thank you once again for updating investors. Can I please ask those on the call not to close this session as we'll now automatically redirect you for the opportunity to provide your feedback so that management can really better understand your views and expectations. This will only take a few moments to complete, but I'm sure will be greatly valued by the company. On behalf of the management team of BBGI Global Infrastructure, we'd like to thank you for attending today's presentation and good afternoon to you all.